speaker, Ms. Anusha Kodanta Raman, who is the manager, quality at Rela Hospital, Dr. Rela Institute of Medical uh, uh, Sciences and Center, Chennai. And Anusha is also an NABH entry level assessor, and she's also an internal assessor for JCI, NABH, and NABL. And uh, she is a co principal investigator in PRAM study, which was conducted by CAHO on blood donor and safety you know, initiative, which was done. So uh, over to you, Anisha, for a wonderful deliberation. Yeah, thank you so much, Abdul, for the introduction. So good evening, everyone. Uh, so thank you, Kaho, and the organizing team for the opportunity given to me. So next 10 minutes, I have to cover in brief on the blood donor safety. As we all know that uh, we come across these donors in day and out of the blood the center practices, we have uh, broadly three types of donors, voluntary donors, replacement donors, and professional donors. But in Indian settings, mostly we encourage for the voluntary uh, donors. So as per the guidelines from the governments and the MOH side, we accept only the voluntary donors, which is non germinator who should be on a low risk health state and also on who is in a healthy state actually. Their things has to be taken care in encouraging that yes we are in safe when we are selecting those donors into the fact and we also should take enough efforts in encouraging for them for the repeat donors and retaining them as in healthy donors that's very very important when we address all these things and the whole concept we are covering in five, five phases that is one is your pre-donor information pre-donor counseling donor questionnaire and health check counseling during donation and your post-donation counseling. So moving on to the first one, uh, before that actually as per WHO, the blood donation is defined as something as a uh, discussion between one-on-one -on -one between the blood donor and the trained counselor. Trained counselor uh, can be in somebody who's done as per the regulatory guidelines, who is a trained, who can act as a trained counselor, which has been already discussed by one of the speakers in the previous thing. And in the pre-donor information, what needs to be covered? So first one, we have to start with the nature and use of the blood components. What are the components I'm going to collect and how I'm going to use what is going to have it and what their eligibility for the donation to go ahead. And a little bit brief on the blood donor questionnaires because we will not give a big hype on saying that you, you need to get fill up a questionnaires having these many questions. By seeing the questionnaires, they may get a shock. Yes, I have come for a donation process. Why should I go for that? All these things has to be given them in a brief and the health assessment process. And it is also their right and we also it is our as an advocate we need to tell the donors that they have a right to withdraw that is called as a self deferral at any phases during the donation process that also need to be told from the blood center staff and the donation process and the little things on the possibilities of the donor reaction which has been touched already on the areas of what need to be done and other things and Post after donations also, we check the products for the possibilities of TTAs and other things. We also have to give them a hint on saying that what do we check and if there are anything going to be there, detected as reactives and positives, how do we inform them and go. And keep the pre-donations area well acute with a lot of information, education materials, maybe in the form of brochures, your standees, your posters, displays, the TVs, whichever is possible in your organization. Keep the pre-donations information very clear so that your patients are able to understand Keep it in a multi-language, one in your local language, other languages based on the donors you get it from your community. And in your pre-donation counseling, so make sure they understand your donor questionnaires, uh, TTA process, and clarify any doubts and other things, whatever they have in your process of things, and the complete donation process. Please ensure that a consent has to be taken during this phase, and your consent has to be bilingual. And... If they are not able to understand, provide them one more interpreters who can get attained. So it should be an inter-information consent process. And please do remember, it's a one-on-one -on -one counseling. Adequate privacy is required during your counseling and it should not be in an open space. We have to respect their privacy because we, need, we are going to ask a lot of health information things. Your counseling is also important. And next, we are moving on with your donor questionnaire and your health check process. Donor questionnaire is a very, very important thing. What I'm going to put in as a questionnaire and get it collected from them because your baseline history collection is very important to see that whether they are a right candidate for the blood donation process. A physical examination with your basic height, ways, BMIs, and other things are also required. And questionnaire also ensure that you have one in your English, one in your local language, which makes them easy and understand. If somebody couldn't uh, able to understand 
please provide them enough support in terms of interpretation and getting it done. And health checks should be done by a minimally by a medical officer who is at least MBBS and above. You need a, a medical officer and a blood bank. And also this concern, please make sure you're in your concern that is a risk is part of your concern. TDAs are there, deferral is there, and the process of reporting your abnormal test. All these things are part of the informed concern process. And this is an exhaustive list on your uh, blood donation questionnaires, which is given from the MOH guidelines, actually. I may not be going in detail in all, all categories. I'll just give a brief on these uh, things. So in well-being, actually check whether they good in health status, physically, mentally, in all terms of means and other things. Uh, if they are physically challenged or mentally challenged, check to that whether they are fitting enough into your criteria. Age. 18 to 65 is a uh, limits and if it is for your uh, aphoresis donors it is only 18 to 60 so it is 65 it is only for repeat donors if it is only for a first time donor it is only cut off is only up to 60 volume it is again based on your weight it is 350 for 45 kgs 450 for somebody in 55 aphoresis up to the weight is limit is 50 kgs and your donation intervals for males and females, it differs, that is three months and four months. And if somebody for aphoresis, it is not more than twice a week or a minimum of 48 as interval. And if I'm going to collect it for a um, donor who has done a whole blood donation and platelet aphoresis, stick on to your 28 days interval. And if, if it is a bone marrow harvest donor and it is for 12 months, if it is only for peripheral stem cell, it is for six months. And BP, check for your uh, systolic 100 to 140 and diastolic 60 to 90 and other cardiac things, anything a patient is having. A normal temperature, pulse, respiratory rate is acceptable. And hemoglobin, um, ideal cutoff is more than of 12.5. And meal is also one important thing. So ideally, they should have taken something before four hours to the donation process. And they should not be in a fasting. Occupation history is also matters because we need to check because post donation, the travels and other things, is anything going to affect maybe during their work hours, dying duties and other things. Some of the risk behaviors with your own lifestyles and other things, risk for your uh, sexually transmitted diseases and other things needs to be checked in. Uh, travels because postnatal and things and donor skin integrity status is also important because the vein pension site also need to be checked for any diseases and your integrity also plays a major role. So that also need to be checked in. And with women, actually, it is with your, uh, we directly differ if they have a history of abortion, breastfeeding, and during the menstruations. So pregnancy, we have to give a period of uh, 12 months and other things. And some of your active symptoms with your fever, common cold flus, and other things, maybe we have to wait until the symptom subsides. Uh, respiratory diseases, central nervous, and most of the things, histories, we need to check in very specifically for the diseases, whatever they have, and stick on to the guidelines uh, given by the MOH. So surgeries, because again, with the surgical histories, because major surgeries have a risk of uh, higher blood loss and other things, we need to defer them for a quiet period. And again, with any patient with any history of cardiovascular diseases, um, uh, start with your short, shortness of breath, chest pains, MIs, medications, chronic heart disease, and other things, we have to permanently refer them because they don't fit into the criteria. With endocrine disorders, uh, diabetes, thyroids, and other things, if they are well controlled enough, yes, we can take it off. And uh, sexually transmitted diseases is a complete uh, decline. And uh, liver diseases, uh, mostly it is uh, deferrals. Certain things we have a period for uh, sometimes based on the disease condition call needs to be taken in and HIV and AIDS it is permanent deferral again and some of your in other infectious diseases like mumps, measles, typhoid, malarias and other things we have to review the uh, symptoms and the deferral periods and their current status with your active symptoms and any other things based on the call need to be taken care and kidney diseases again needs to be looked into their current conditions and deferrals has to be looked in so other things with your uh, um, bleeding disorders and other things we are going for a permanent deferral vaccinations so we have to go for the deferral period based on your live vaccines or your live activated vaccines go on for a deferral period according to that Madam, last and, minutes. yeah uh, based on the drugs actually some of the drugs we have a lot of uh, drugs with the patients may be again some commonly used drugs are acceptable and uh, some of the other drinks when the patient is on we need to give a uh, deferral period of certain months and weeks which needs to be again for uh, taken into it and uh, guidelines reason uh, guidelines from the MOH it is on the COVID-19 infection so it is, has to be if they are in your communities and other things to be for a 28 days of quarantines and if they are with your symptoms and other things go for a deferral so that is what is the latest guideline and 
please do remember during donation also your counseling doesn't stop so during donation even though it's a quite uh, maybe a five minutes or 15 minutes or one hour or whatever the patient is undergoing ensure that you give her adequate psychological support and care is taken during a little vein which a small a smile and a comfort during the donation or uh, communication makes a lot of difference because this will have and yeah, ensure that you are taking measures to reduce your anxiety, maybe with your diversional therapy, with your music, TVs, or other things in your donation rooms. Uh, gives a lot of comfort for them to understand, yes, they are in a comfortable zone, which will have a larger impact in decreasing your post-donor reactions. And give little information on what they should do, what they should not do immediate post-donations. That is also very important. And the next uh, thing is on your immediate post-donation self-care. Ensure that you're, you have a refreshment rooms with your refreshments, all those things placed on. You have a space for monitoring them before they walk out of your blood center. And do remember to monitor for ADS and give little information to the donors also what they can expect even after they uh, leave from your premises of your ADS because ADS has been already touched in retail. It's our the responsibility of the blood center staff to monitor the ADS and to report to Hemovigilance Program of India. So And give always an IAZ materials, give a lot of information on your healthy lifestyles and other things. Take efforts to collect your feedbacks in your post-donation area. So all feedbacks matters a lot because it's a voice of your donors, which is going to help you to know the way that you're rendering your services that will help us to improve a lot in your sense. And with your donor registry, ensure that it's been given your donor card, make your donor registry updated, give them a certificate and thank them for their donations and other things. And also before they leave, once again, reinforce on the TTAs and other processes. And if you are going to identify it after that, if you are going to identify that something is going to be a positive or some other infections have been identified, we need to have a clear cut defined mechanism how we are going to communicate to them. It is not only through your verbals and other things, phone calls. We need to call them back and we have to take efforts then back to our centers, come back and then counseling because it's a very big uh, tedious process in uh, it is not only with the single things. We have to confirm the test and then we have to give them. So I have just uh, taken a flowchart again from the guideline for the easy understandings of your things. So whenever you have your stage one, we have already seen stage one and stage two. So mainly on your blood donor screenings and other things where you have your reactive donors and non-reactive donors. If it is non-reactive, yes, you are continuing with them as a repeat donors. You are updating in your histories and there. If they are going to be a reactive donors, again, retest. If it is negative, put them into the negative slots. If it is going to be positive, check what type of infections they have. Maybe with your hepatitis B and other things, which would be referred to your hepatologist or a gastroenterologist. HIV, it needs to be intimated to the ICTC as per the NACO guidelines. And malaria and syphilis, it will be referred to your physicians and syphilis for STD. So all these things has to be taken in a nutshell to ensure that your donor is being safe, even though their blood is not being utilized by us. And this is what uh, is a recent things we have also, uh, along with COHO, we have taken initiative of measuring your donor experience. That is a PREM we have done on your blood donor and safety. So we have one more speaker who is going to cover on PREM, but for all your information, this is available as a white paper. You can follow the link and download that paper for you to refer and use it in your institution. And these are some of the references which I have used. So that's from me. And thank you for the opportunity given. If there are any questions, put it in the chat box.